and he looked completely out of place. You know when you get a, a feeling, you just get a really bad feeling, creepy feeling, shivers type thing. The fall all around you, not believing it's real. How can this happen? So many emotions to feel. This is Miri. I've been listening to these girls recording in my basement for hours. And I have to warn you, there's some very foul language and adult content going on. Listener, discretion is advised. Welcome, listeners. We're We're Shedding shedding light. Light. We're three moms on a mission, Candy, Susie, and Angela. And we're hell-bent on shedding light on missing persons cold cases across Canada. In an effort to help families find the missing piece of the puzzle. Welcome to episode two of our first season entitled, What Happened to Melanie Etier? If you haven't listened to episode one or our introduction podcast, we suggest you do in order to understand the storyline and also to understand why we are doing what we are doing, the catalyst and motivation behind this project. In our last episode, we gave you a lot of details about Melanie's disappearance, derived mostly from archived newspaper articles we found online from the Temiskaming Speaker. So a big shout out to the Temiskaming Speaker for doing such great work reporting on Melanie's case. This is Susie here. Thanks, Angela. Uh, We like to present facts and information we have researched and gathered and then discuss those details we have presented as the three moms that we are. Our first thoughts and reactions when we first learn the facts as moms, as outsiders looking in. We don't claim to be investigative journalists or private investigators. To me, it's like watching a murder mystery unfold. Sometimes the most likely suspect is actually innocent and the mystery concludes with a surprise ending. We cannot be narrow-minded and avoid discussing any possibilities because for the most part, we have no way of knowing whether they have been investigated and eliminated or not. Keeping Melanie's story alive can only ignite memories and conversation and hopefully bring to light the missing piece of the puzzle. We cannot begin to imagine the pain and suffering a parent goes through when their child goes missing. The longer the mystery of what happened to their child, the colder the case gets. We can only imagine that it is their focus each and every day. As much as they may attempt to get on with their daily living, it is their end all and be all. The question of what happened to their child eats away at them every single day. Not only is someone responsible for what happened to that child, they have essentially stolen the life of at least one more person, the parents of that child. Our hearts go out to Melanie's mom, Celine. We hope and pray for answers for her and want more than anything for her to be able to bring her daughter home. So before we could delve deeper in Melanie's disappearance, we needed to take a road trip to New Leskard. I wanted Susie and Angela to get a feel for the community, and we wanted to experience the route that Melanie walked back in September 29th, 1996. While in New we were able to speak to a lot of people. We want to thank everyone for their willingness to speak openly with us. We truly appreciate all the information. When we began this process, we decided early on not to mention names, of the majority of people associated with Melanie's disappearance. We don't want to cause any issues or harm to anyone's reputation. Our goal is to walk you through the case and hopefully reach a person who might be able to help bring Melanie home. So let's talk about the town of New Lisker. It is a small community located in Northern Ontario. In 2004, the name was changed to Temiskaming Shores. This happened when they amalgamated New Liskert, Helleberry, and Diamond Township. Currently, the population is about 10,000 people. So it's a nice small town where you felt very comfortable. 
I personally grew up there, felt very, very safe. There was many times I babysat till two in the morning and walked home and never gave a thought of anything bad happening to me. And I'm sure you ladies can agree mm. that you've well, we, been out late. <laughs> you've been out well, oh, late. Oh, right. I've been out late and we were both, Angela and I were both from a small town and it wasn't, you know, you didn't think twice about walking home. Um, even at a young age, I used to roller skate and walk home. You know, it was only a few blocks away, but still we'd walk home late at night. Well, I think you take for granted home. the small town feel, right? You know, everybody, mm-hmm. everybody knows your business. So you just, you feel safe. And well, I'm sure. And you know, everybody, so you don't feel threatened because there are no strangers in a small town. Everybody knows everybody and everybody's got your back. True. Whether, yes. whether they're your nosy neighbor or they're not, it's kind of nice that everybody knows your business, but sometimes that can actually be a good thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or a bad thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then Candy, when Angela and I joined you on the road trip to New Liskard, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the town, but did become familiar. So maybe you, you can kind of discuss the route from Pine Avenue to where Melanie lived. Yes. Um, well, in New Liskard, we wanted to walk it just to understand how long it would take to get to Melanie's house. And for me, when I saw it, I would think if I was 15, 16, that would be nothing. I would easily walk that. There was um, a small, like it's almost like a back road, but very quickly you hit the main road, which is Armstrong Street, and it's lit up. So that night, it was a Saturday night, early Sunday morning, Docks was open, which is a, a bar in New Liskard. That would be the only thing that I would see that might give me a little bit of a, should I walk home? Because it was the bar letting out. So I would be a little nervous. Yeah. But um, it's not a long walk. There's the bridge, which is nicely lit. And then the only other place that I think I would have some hesitance would be that back road. Remember when we were going up to Melanie's place Mm -hmm. and there was uh, the video store. It used to be the video store. It was kind of creepy and dark, Mm -hmm. but that would be it. But we know that she was seen on that bridge, correct? Or there was a sighting? There was a reported sighting, yes, that we will bring up later in this episode, I do believe. But even that that night going back, I think someone did some research, Angela, and there was two days past full moon. That's when it would have been. So the sky still would have been fairly bright. If it was a clear night, and from all Mm -hmm. accounts, it was a clear night, and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, the full moon was on the 26th, so it was two nights later. So it still would have been almost full, so quite bright. Mm -hmm. So what did you guys think of that walk? I I thought it would take her maybe a max 10 minutes to get home. That's what I figure. And I don't think you'd be dilly-dallying when when it's nighttime. You'd probably be walking pretty brisk. I used to, but yeah, like I said, I, I I would have likely walked it by myself as well. Yeah, we wouldn't have thought twice about it. Happened yeah. all the time when we were young. And I mean, that was quite a few years earlier, but <laughs> so of course, after all of that happened, Melanie went missing. The first suspects are always the person or persons who last saw the victim. And that's where our suspicions lay immediately. And the good folk of the town of New Liskard were no different. So let's talk for a bit about the group that were together that night. It was actually two groups. It was Melanie and her best friend and her boyfriend at the time with his three best buddies. One of the boys' girlfriends had spent some time with them earlier that evening as well, and she had walked around with them for a bit with her big white dog before she turned and headed back home just after dark. One of the boys continued on home when the group arrived at Pine Avenue at approximately 10 p.m. or so. And that left the two girls, Melanie and her best friend, and the three boys. Sometime between 10 p.m. and 12.30 a.m., one of the remaining three boys left. Then Melanie's girlfriend left the residence at 12.30 a.m. As mentioned in previous episode, she was spooked by a car a few minutes into her walk home. It slowly approached the intersection as she was walking through it, almost as if it was checking her out. And then it ceased any further interaction. So this, as you have already heard, left Melanie at the house for at least another hour with her boyfriend and the young man who lived at the Pine Avenue residence until she reportedly left for home on foot 
sometime between 1.30 and 2 a.m. We were fortunate enough to call um, three of the boys. Uh, there was one that was unavailable. So we actually got to know them, understand them. Um, they had respect and fond memories of Melanie. They only said nice things. However, I don't think this was a long friendship. I think it was only a couple months that they had been hanging around, not like uh, her best friend. It's These were just new acquaintances. So I want to mention now, start with her boyfriend and how this has impacted him because we did get to speak to him. He's a very nice gentleman. He has... Um, lived with this for almost 24 years it uh he had they had been questioned by police and they did a polygraph which they all passed i don't know if that was made notice for the public but it's good to put it out there because they did take a lot of grief and i understand the public because you you think like we started at this beginning that the last people to see them would be the ones that are involved. These boys took a lot of grief and it's very unfortunate because they were Mm -hmm. 16 years old and it totally changed their lives forever. So her boyfriend, the biggest regret he has ever had is not walking her home, but that can happen to any of us. We all make silly mistakes or just, we don't think he wouldn't have thought that this was going to happen. So we have to be, you know, very careful with him because it's not fair if, if people gang up on him because I have, you know, two boys and my son is older now, but he would make silly decisions back at 16 because it's about you. So, and they'd only been dating for about three weeks. So it was kind of a new relationship. So they probably weren't as committed to each other. I think it's kind of a gray area, right? They were hanging out for a while, but it wasn't official in the teenage world. Um, So they had been hanging out for a few months. Um, But yeah, since what, you know, when the relationship became officially a relationship may have only been a few weeks and and maybe the boyfriend's eyes, but. And he's even to this day getting some grief um, because people keep, won't let him forget it. And it's, yeah. uh, it's very unfortunate. And well, I feel that it's the whispers and the sideways glances in small towns, right? People that's right. Muttering under their breath or whispering behind hands. Yeah. yeah I mean, sad. he even said to us that people believed he did it. He was a murderer. Like, how do you feel at 16 when you think half the town thinks that of you and it's just not true. So it's very unfortunate that, that it's affected a lot of people. A lot of people. That's even even the boy's house they were at. I, we didn't get to speak to him, but to this day, he's still feeling guilt and he can't really talk about it. And the parents, I can't imagine them because if it was my house and my son had let the girl walk home and I don't know what I'd do. Mm-hmm. I would feel some remorse and I would feel guilt and I would be like you didn't plan on this and it's just so many balls of emotions exactly so much emotion and if only for foresight right that's right yeah that's right well I I mean obviously it's left permanent scars on on all of these kids that were with Melanie that night um the boyfriend has remained. I think he moved away for some time, but he is actually still in the area and trying to live his life. Um, and most of the rest of them have scattered across the country. Some of them rarely even go back to visit. Um, Mm -hmm. so it's sad. There's so many mixed feelings we got from the young men. There was Mm -hmm. anger, there was hurt, there was grief. I mean, we heard tears. It Mm -hmm. breaks my heart when I think about Melanie was, the next closest thing to an angel. There's no doubt about it. She was extremely sweet, very kind, very funny. She she came across to me as being smart. I never saw any report cards, so I can't tell you if the grades matched it, but Mm -hmm. I can tell you 100% that she came across intelligent. Um... You know, we we all we all come together. We all had a good time. That's for sure. We 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 so many times gathered at even my parents' house in the basement, just listening to music. Like Angela said, there's rumors and sideways glances, and it couldn't have been easy for them. I think about you know, I commented in the first episode that I didn't understand 
why Melanie walked home alone. And I want to make it clear that it was just an initial thought as a mom that ran through my head. I in no way was casting blame on anybody, particularly Melanie's boyfriend with whom we've personally spoken to. You know, I just, you know, we all wish we could have some sort of uh, foresight that we could change some of our past decisions. It's a one-off situation. No one had any way of knowing what to, what, what was going to happen to Melanie that night. And, you know, if we did have foresight, we could all avoid all the dangers and tragedies that await us in life. Unfortunately, we don't. Um, I mentioned my son, and since researching this, this project, he and I have had discussions of the importance of walking a girl home. And that's something that was not always done in the past. That's at our fantastic. House. That's yeah, fantastic yeah. because, yeah, it does open communication and maybe a lot more parents can say to their children, even if it's a girl walking another girl home, mm-hmm. you know, try to be careful or figure something out because, you know, you don't think of it, but it can happen and you can never get those moments back, but still have fun. You know, we don't exactly. want to limit right. everybody. But you just have worried. to be, you know, a buddy system and just be cognizant Absolutely. and aware of your surroundings. Well, and it's so much easier now too, when you think cell phones, et cetera, easy, yeah. easy to keep in touch back then. They just didn't have that technology. Mm -hmm. So we also corresponded with Melanie's best friend who was with her that night. And uh, unfortunately, um, and understandably so, she decided not to get involved with this project. And we can understand and respect that because we can't imagine the tragedy of losing your best friend. It would, I mean, to say devastating is an understatement. And of course, to bring it all back to the surface after so many more years would be challenging to say the least. So we understand that. And we also have heard that the months and years that followed were particularly difficult for her. And, and I think all of them, you know, whether they yeah, blame you know, themselves or wish they could have done something differently if they had just, you know, somebody left five minutes earlier or later, would it, have, would it have changed the course of history? We don't know that. But I'm sure each and every one of them lives with with a lot of regret. burden every day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you and, know what I was thinking? Oh, sorry. You know what I was thinking is I can't imagine with us talking to them about it, I didn't think about how it would affect them afterwards because now we've put them through it again and thank Mm -hmm. goodness they've all been you know extremely kind and understanding but we need to say thank you to these boys for for opening up to us and we apologize if we've caused any extra harm or anything and we'll listen anytime you know we touched on it before at that age do you ever, ever possibly in your most wildest imagination ever think something like that could happen in a small town? And I just, I remember how carefree and bold I was. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you think you're invincible. And and then all of a sudden, overnight, your whole life changes. And think yeah. back when we were growing up, when hitchhiking was big. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I hitchhiked all the time. Oh, me too. I, 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 I miss the school bus almost every day. <laughs> and just hitchhike. Yeah. And that's, yeah. 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 So that's how carefree we were. And especially when you're younger nowadays, as it's so funny, when you become a mom, you're so protective of everything because you know what you did back then and thought, no, you can actually get very hurt. So don't do it. But mm-hmm. yeah. So exactly. just, just to conclude and and clarify that a little bit to the very best of our knowledge the two boys that were with Melanie last at the house that night on Pine Avenue were both given polygraphs and were both eliminated as suspects so thank we just you wanted Edge. to make that very clear to everybody listening the public should know that for sure absolutely yeah. well and weeks weeks went by with no sign of Mel no crime scene no evidence it was like she disappeared into thin air the town was in a state of heightened alert as you can only imagine not only was melanie missing but we should point out that there had been a murder in kearns township a neighboring area in april of that year 1996 so only five short months before melanie disappeared um this was a 47 year old man uh his name was 
Louis Gauthier. He was murdered about uh, 20 minutes north of New Liskard. So then, well, six weeks after Melanie went missing, another teen was reported missing. This time, a young man, an 18-year-old, uh, was last reported as having been seen on November 6, 1996. So this just escalated fear in the town. Like, what was happening? Not one, but two young people are missing and a murder? Crazy for the small town. Just crazy. So what happened to Melanie Eche? Let's explore some facts and theories and surmise on what the possibilities might be. So again, we are not private eyes and we are not, you know, uh, we're not claiming to know. We are surmising, okay? So from information and facts and theories that we have gathered. So from what we've heard from these great people that have shared a lot of stories and information with us is that there was a party on Pine Street that, um, you know, so there's people there, there's a party going on, there's obviously drinking, probably. And if, if anyone is out there that was on the party at Pine Street, wants to share whose party it was or talk to us about the party, we'd accept it because we just want to understand what the atmosphere was at night. Because um, Pine's not very long, like you showed no. the street. And I mean, um, the fellow's house where Melanie was that night was at one end. It, yeah. It's not that long of a street. So if there was a party on that street, somebody out there has to know whose party it was. Well, people were drinking. You never know what mm-hmm. can happen. So mm-hmm. and, we just and want just, some information. Just to mention to listeners too, that we do have a map posted on our Facebook page um, it's a map that Melanie's mom, Celine, posted on her Facebook page. So we've shared it on ours. It's a map of the route Melanie would have taken that night from Pine Avenue to her house on Wellington. Oh, Correct. thanks, Angela. That's a, that's a good idea because then some people can take a look and, and just see the distance and how it wasn't a very long walk. It may look longer on the map, but when we did it, it was... And we, but mind you, we did it at during the day, so it didn't seem... It's scary at all. There's also three weddings in town. Um, so did they have nighttime receptions? Uh, were there any questionable guests there? Was anybody under the influence maybe a little too much? Um, what people were staying, when you're, there's weddings, there's people staying from out of town. So they're staying in motels. So you just, these are possibilities of what might have happened. And we're just trying to put it all together and try to figure out not a solution or or whatever, but we just want to get as much information. So if you were at a wedding that night and you saw someone that was acting strange or whatever, or just you can let us know. Questionable. Thank you. (laughs) It'd be nice to know. Again, I mentioned Mm -hmm. Doc's bar, which was about a block from the path that she would have traveled. And I was there a few times, just a few. <laughs> I, t- I think I did a summer there, but um, <laughs> sorry, ladies. But uh, you know, they get out at two o'clock, and you want to continue to party. And and or, in my case, we'd go to Quebec and party even more. But um, so, did someone leave there inebriated or fancying a nice girl that's walking by herself? You just don't know. There was also so. I don't know. When you guys left the bars when you were 19, did you go out after? We didn't go home. No, <laughs> yeah. Usually found a party or or you'd hang out on Main Street or some, go somewhere and grab something to eat and hang outside of there. You know, and, you usually and if didn't anybody go right knows, home. if anybody right. knows that was at Docks and saw her, well, you know, any tip would be great. And you think if there was a party on Pine Avenue and the bar was just getting out, Mm-hmm. You would think there'd be at least a little bit of foot traffic from one to the other, right? Small town, a party, everybody knows about it. And well, we used if, to if do they're that of we... age, then right. they would be at the bar and go to the house party after. Yeah. So yeah. again, yeah. anybody that was out that night, we'd love to hear from you. Mm-hmm. So just across from Doc's was a video store called uh, Night Owls. So I'm just wondering if there was any footage because I do, I know from someone that had worked there that they did have video cameras and it would be nice to know if there was 
any video mm-hmm. footage or if the police did get any of that video footage, that would be fantastic. They don't have to share mm-hmm. with us, but that was another thought of maybe possibly and it's tough. seeing someone. It's tough for us to know what's been looked into and what hasn't, right? So we're just putting it all out there. Yes. Yeah. And so, what else was there around the area? Um, well, there were two hitchhikers spotted yes. right outside of docks. Um, somebody probably notified the police and the Tamiskaming speaker reported on it that there were two females hitchhiking outside docks at about 2.10 a.m. So hmm. we're wondering who they were. Did they see anything? Yeah. And also there was a rumor that her father might have taken her. and. Um, that I think has been squashed, especially by the police. Not even that the it's not it didn't happen. So mm-hmm. that's ru- one rumor we can kind of put to bed because uh, he was there was cleared nothing completely. To it. Yeah, he was completely cleared of any suspicion. So I yes. think that's just just for listeners who might be assuming that or know a little bit more about the case. Um, that's not on our radar at all. Yeah. <laughs> so if you heard that about Melanie's dad, now you know. He's been cleared. That's right off of our radar. We're not even thinking about that anymore. And another interesting theory we've heard, um, we've had a a lot of people tell us that a predominant theory around town was that a hunter or hunters from Quebec or the U.S. or otherwise might be responsible for Melanie's disappearance. So because we're not familiar with that area, Um, or hunting in that area, we got in touch with Pete Gilbo, and he's a recently retired conservation officer with the Ministry of Natural Resources, and he worked in the New Liskert area from 2001 to 2020. And Pete told us that he feels the theory that a hunter was responsible is a little bit far-fetched for the following reasons. So the only hunting seasons that would have been open in New Liskert in late September would have been small game, so primarily grouse and waterfowl, Um, Moose didn't open until Thanksgiving weekend, which was a couple of weeks later, and Mm -hmm. deer not until the 1st of November, so another month later. The fall bear season would have been open, but the vast majority of bear hunting there in the 90s occurred in the spring, not in September. And while he supposed technically pheasant season would have been open, there are no pheasants within about 400 miles of New Liskard. So, so no hunters around that time. Well, yeah, he he kind of uh, dismissed the theory. So mm-hmm. he, he said in his experience, neither small game nor waterfowl hunting attract many lo- non-local hunters. So they're mostly local people. So there wouldn't be transients coming in mm-hmm. for right. waterfowl hunting or small game. And and none, virtually none from the U.S. So any American big game hunters moose or bear, um, they're required to stay with a licensed outfitter. So they would not have been camping out anywhere. They'd be staying with a lodge with a licensed outfitter. So addressing info that had been shared with us about hunters camping along road 568, which is also known as Mowat Landing Road, he goes on to further state In his time as a conservation officer, he was not aware of any American hunters who would come there to the Mowat Landing Road and camp out at Mowat Landing and area. So he suspects that would also have been true in the mid-90s. Certainly in the summer and even into mid-September, there are lots of non-local anglers who visit the area. But again, virtually all of those folks would stay at outfitters and lodges. So that seems to dispel the theory of a hunter being responsible. So that was great information. Like that was awesome that he shared that. Pete was wonderful. Like he responded to me within 24 hours. It was great. More more than happy to help. That's what we're finding is just uh, everybody is so happy to help in any way. And everybody wants the same. Uh, And we would have never known this. Oh, sorry. We would have never known this. So we can share this with you because now we know that's probably not feasible at all. No. Um, and another, I mean, we might as well mention it. it's worth mentioning. Um, some people had uh, come forward. We had seen some rumors on social media uh, theory uh, regarding human sex trafficking. According to the latest data from Statistics Canada, there is a rate of about one human trafficking incident for every 100,000 Canadians. And the vast majority of trafficking victims are women under 25. 
we heard rumors, uh, like I mentioned, about sex trafficking at that time uh, in 1996 uh, in Northern Ontario and in Quebec, but we haven't unearthed very much at all. Very little, actually, in the way of facts. It is not common practice for girls to be taken. Uh, they're more just lured, right, into that life by promises or money or drugs. And I can't see Melanie being the type of girl that would be lured. So they don't usually just uh, snack you up off the street and, and take you and you become this. It's usually they start off by becoming your friend and promising you things and feeding you drugs and offering you a better lifestyle. And, and that's how girls become lured and then become dependent on these people. So I think we can kind of close our eyes to that one because that's something that needed yeah. to be brought up. But other than that, I, I think it's, like, and it does happen. It does happen yeah. out there. We know yeah. that we hear stories all the time, but um, it's a possibility, possi- but yeah. highly, highly unlikely. Right. Yes. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, another situation or something we've heard about a transient or a trucker coming off the highway and maybe, you know, grabbing Melanie or something. Um, I live there. So when you go off Highway 11, you have to actually physically go into New Liskard. So I can't wrap my head around a trucker driving off the main highway when there's a truck stop up there and coming to New Lisker at two o'clock in the morning, knowing that there's nothing open. Not to say that it hasn't happened, but I just think it, he wouldn't be driving down that path because it's such a, you, be, you notice a huge truck going through town. Mind you, a transient, I don't know. Maybe they're looking for a place to stay or anywhere through there, but uh, because there's hotels and motels all around. So it could be anything like there's two gas stations that were close to that area. So maybe someone thought, hey, I'll just see if there's a gas station open. But um, would I they d- have been open that late at night? No, no, no. no. Well, but maybe they thought. Would know that. Yeah. Yeah, Some, yeah. Somebody that wrote to us, um, a local resident, said as far as, as he knew, the SO would have been open at 2 a.m. And oh, again, correct. who knows? Oh. I mean, I remember back in the day when we were young, the gas stations would be open after the bar back then. And that was years before this, and it was small town. So we d- we don't know. Again, we're just guessing and surmising. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yep. She was spotted on the bridge around 2 a.m., which, if true, means that she would have had to make it past the ESO at the corner of Pine and Armstrong. Armstrong is the main road across the bridge. So she mm-hmm. she, you know... Well, the two gas stations were both on her route, right? They were mm-hmm. both on arms. I, I, I don't know. I only know Mr. Gas. So the other one I don't know of, but I can be wrong. But I don't remember. There's, there's a gas station near the Highway 11 going out of town, both sides. But mm-hmm. I think the only one downtown is Mr. Gas. But I could be wrong. You know, back in 1996, I, you know, yeah. maybe it was around. But the other thing that someone pointed out to us was uh, the, the motels in town. Anybody who was traveling to or from a motel from town that night would have driven along Armstrong across the bridge. Across the bridge as well. And yeah. mm-hmm. again, along Melanie's path. So because there were three weddings in town, there could have been all kinds of different people staying at a motel that night transients they weren't locals if they were staying at a motel but again that path that she took is a main route where a lot of people would have been passing through even at that hour mm-hmm. coming so up it, coming back from a wedding you mm-hmm. just feel like Driving somebody home. somebody more than one person would have seen her i just mm-hmm. i feel anyways mm-hmm. i mean people have surmised over the years um that there were three murderers who were active active around that time that could be potential mm-hmm. uh, potential suspects Paul Hachey, I'm believing I'm saying his name correct, um, his crimes date back to 1988, but it was uh, the 1997 death of Sarah Whitehead in North Bay. I know her family. Um, it was her death that tipped police to his other crimes. The 20-year-old was sexually assaulted and slain after she left a shopping mall in North Bay, and the OPP in Sturgeon Falls had a warrant for Mr. Hachey's arrest. He was wanted for stealing a bike, of all things, um, when an officer heard that he had been arrested in Calgary for a violent sexual assault in December 97. The officer contacted the police in North Bay and said, hey, there might be a connection to Miss Whitehead's death. So Calgary police sent a cigarette butt 
left at the crime scene to North Bay and DNA came back and it was a perfect match. Um, Hechi was uh, formerly of Sturgeon Falls. He had admitted to police that he had killed a 46-year-old man in Toronto and had, a sexually, had sexually assaulted three women in Edmonton. But his MO doesn't match Melanie's case mm-hmm. uh, at all. But the fact that he had been in Northern Ontario the following year certainly made him look suspicious. So as far as we know, he's been ruled out by police. Um, there was another Richard Bouillon, he was a repeated sex offender. He confessed to killing Julie Supranon on his deathbed. She was a young girl from a small town in Quebec, north of Montreal, about eight hours from Blizzard, though. Um, on November 15th, 1999, the 16-year-old Julie disappeared at a bus stop around 50 meters from her home, just 50 meters from her home. Her mm-hmm. remains were never recovered. So how sad is that? <sighs> Uh, we know what that's like working yeah. on this this project. Um, the third one that was around uh, active it, during that time would have been Michael Wayne McGray, who was from New Brunswick. He was tracked across Canada. He had he was a Canadian serial killer convicted of killing seven individuals, and he claims to have killed eleven others between 1985 and 1998. His victims were all between the ages of seven. Oh, that just makes me sick. Seven and 18 years old. Um, all the way across Halifax, St. John, Montreal, Newfoundland, Ottawa, Toronto, Calgary, Vancouver, and Seattle. McGray had victims across Canada during the time Melanie went missing. You know, we have no idea, but we can only assume that all three of these murderers were looked into it and they didn't place high on the list of uh, suspects in Melanie's case. And I remember the one in North Bay and to think he was far away I know. and they caught it's him crazy. it's well, just dna fantastic. right uh, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, never say never and even after 24 years in melanie's case never say never because somebody does know something that's um, right yeah so in 2000 the mcgarry landfill was searched um that's right around virginia town in northern ontario and a number of exhibits were gathered in regards to melanie's case Apparently, this was in response to rumors that a group of teens from Virginia Town was responsible for Melanie's disappearance. The name of one individual has been mentioned numerous times, and friends, family, and acquaintances have commented that it wouldn't surprise them if he were involved in Melanie's disappearance. In 1999, we did mention this in our previous episode, when Dawson Point was searched, Um, We found out this was apparently due to a tip the police received stating someone had hit Melanie with a car. They were driving without a driver's license and they were recently out of jail. So they panicked. They put her body in the trunk of the car and proceeded to bury her at Dawson Point. And as far as we know, nothing was found there. But the police decided to act on this rumor nonetheless, whether it was a rumor or a tip. We suspect, but are not positive, that this search revolved around the same suspect or suspects as in the Virginia Town teen theory when they investigated the McGarry landfill. Another rumor. My uh, my head's spinning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. There's, there's just there's so many possibilities Mm -hmm. and And this is where we walked into it because Mm -hmm. you girls came in 23 years later and well myself I heard about it but you guys all came in at the same time and and we have to sort through all of this and so often right rumors come from a tiny little grain of truth it's it's, that's right I don't know if we've said that before but the telephone game right Yep, mm-hmm. you state a fact and it gets repeated and repeated and repeated till you can almost not recognize it anymore. But there's a tiny little bit of truth to it. So, mm-hmm. exactly. So, in the weeks and months following Melanie's disappearance, there was an arrest made in December of 1996, just before Christmas, actually. A 33 year old man and his 17 year old nephew were arrested and charged for the murder of Louis Gautier that took place in April of that year. The police also issued a warrant for the arrest of the young man who was still missing since November, as he too faced charges in regards to the murder. The young man who was missing was the half-brother of the teen already charged. 
Sounds confusing, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So from all accounts that, that we've read, Louis Gautier, who was murdered in April, was a drug dealer. Mm-hmm. Um, he was also homosexual. And we've heard many rumors about how the trio, the uncle and the two nephews who were half brothers, were extremely racist, um, that the uncle was very homophobic. And we just wonder what this might have to do with Melanie's case. It makes you think Mm -hmm. that if um, they can do that, then anybody can do anything. Mm -hmm. So in April of 1998 two years to the day, actually, after the murder of Louis Gautier, the body of the missing young man was found. The uncle and the half-brother were charged with his murder as well. So not only did they kill Louis Gautier, they also killed their nephew, half-brother. So it became apparent through the court proceedings in the following years that the murdered young man went to the police to report the previous murder in April and his right. uncle and brother found out and they decided that they needed to kill him in order to keep their secret. Well, and that's why when we headed to Nuliskerd, I wanted to, I'm, I was born in Tomstown, which is just outside of Ingleheart and around the Hilliardton area. So I wanted to show the girls how remote it is and how quiet it is out there. So we did take a trip and um, I showed them the back roads and there's not many houses around. It's very sparse. It's very spread out. And um, I wanted to take them to the Blanche River because in the court reports, correct, that they some of the material from the Louis Gauthier murder was found in the, under the Thompson Bridge on the Blanche River. And I wanted to show the girls just how this happened and where it's at. And um, we did post a picture of you two on the bridge, mm-hmm, but right. we just wanted to get a uh, perspective of if you could sneak in and drop this stuff off in the middle of the day, in the middle of the night, it was really quiet there. There, I don't think uh, maybe two cars went by when we're out there. It's mm-hmm. pretty I could see doing back. it at night. I mean, they obviously did it, and that's where the, the items were found that were from Mr. Gochi's home. But just, I don't know, even being there in person, you'd think, God, it's such a, it, it's sort of a wide open space. I just, uh, pretty bold. Yeah, but if you know the place and you know that who lives around there, and, and um, obviously... Yeah, there's there, a, there are a lot of back roads back there. there yeah, <laughs> a we lot did of back get roads. One, yeah, we um and we wanted to because you were talking about the other the the nephew and the brother that was murdered. He, they, they found his body at the um, in a gravel pit in a gravel pit out in Hillierton. So uh, we wanted, I wanted to take the girls there just to experience. And that is really remote where you could easily. Well, when our, when our GPS stopped working, that's when I got a little, just a little, (laughs) a little. Yeah, we got nervous that we were so far out in the bush and yeah, it was, it was nerve wracking for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's an experience. So we're not talking about this wide open with lots of people living around we're talking about in the middle of nowhere and uh, you could scream and no one would hear you that's what we were worried because we're on the road and had no gps Mm -hmm. will someone hear us but just to experience it because you have to i think you have to experience locations and just understand what you're reading Mm -hmm. so that's why we did post a picture so you understood when you hear about this that that plant, that Thompson Bridge that the girls were standing on is where a lot of the items from Louis Gauthier was found, that mm-hmm. they just dumped it off there. And I think they did that because there was construction going on at the time, and they thought it would hide all the evidence. Just get buried under the new bridge. Yeah. Yeah. So they thought ahead. So it it's just very, shows you. Um, it gets very confusing. I'm sure as a listener, it was, has been confusing for us for the most part to sort through all of the information we've been given. Um, 
believe us, it is confusing. We too had a very difficult time keeping everything straight. And without names, it can get even more confusing. Um, We don't want to share names, obviously, because we're not pointing the finger at anyone. But it doesn't even stop there. There's a very strong possibility that Melanie's disappearance is a case of mistaken identity. In New Liskard in 1996, there were only three young black girls. They were all about the same age. Um, We spoke with, we'll call her girl number one. She relayed to us a run-in she had had with one of the brothers uh, from the aforementioned trio we just spoke of. Uh, One of those boys yelled racial slurs at her and said he was going to grab his gun and kill her and others like her. These are her words. As we mentioned earlier, we have had many reports of this trio being extremely, extremely racist. Uh, Racist and angry enough to put, uh, to just snatch who they thought was, uh, you know, could they have done that? Could they have been angry? uh, I don't know. Could they have just snatched somebody in the dark? Highly unlikely, but it's, it is possible. From everything we've been told, Melanie and the third young girl looked strikingly alike, twins, if you will. People mistook them all the time. In, even their own relatives sometimes would um, have said to us that they looked very much alike and sometimes uh, they would even confuse them from afar. So um, talking about this particular look alike, uh, this teen had run away sorry, not run away. She ran around with a different crowd than Melanie. She was dabbling in drugs. She was a bit of a troubled child. We spoke to her mother. Her mother has been very, very forthcoming and her name was Sarah. Uh, We want to use her name. We're not accusing her of anything and we will eventually explain why we're using her name. We spoke to Sarah's friend also who stated that Sarah told her on Friday, that she was really worried. She owed a drug dealer some money. She told her friend not to be surprised as she went missing over the weekend. So on Monday, she said to her friend with a grin, look, I'm still here. When her friend asked if she had not heard about Melanie and proceeded to tell her Melanie was missing, Sarah's face dropped like she had just seen a ghost. Like the seriousness of what had just happened hit her like a ton of bricks. And Sarah lived on Pine Avenue, the same street that Melanie disappeared from. Coincidence? I don't know. We think not. So let's talk about that for a bit. What are your thoughts, Angela? Well, Sarah was involved in drugs. The trio, and and I think that's a good term to use to refer to the uncle and the two nephews, the trio... um, from all accounts, I mean, they killed a drug dealer and we understand at least one of them was doing drugs from said drug dealer. So there were drugs involved in some, if not all of those lives of the trio. Um, We heard many, many rumors that the young man that went missing and later turned up deceased, we heard rumors that he and Melanie were friends and that they were after Melanie because of that. Well, we know Melanie didn't hang out with that group of people. So we're thinking that it's, again, a case of mistaken identity, that it was actually Sarah who perhaps hung out with that group or one of the boys in that trio. Um, I think the biggest thing is that Sarah was scared and said that I'm in big trouble mm -hmm. and you may not see me on Monday And um, then all of a sudden, someone that looks basically exactly like her, because I even heard that um, she was getting stopped in the street by people saying, Melanie, you're, you know, everybody's looking for you. That's how close Mm -hmm. she looked like. Uh, Melanie is, they were stopping her and asking her, you better call your mom. She's missing you. And she had to tell them, no, I'm Sarah. I'm not Melanie. So to, to mistake that identity, I think is a great possibility. And having, think, like you said, on Pine Street, yeah, that, exactly. That is, that I is, think it needs to be reiterated and kind of, um, like we had said, we had spoken to uh, many people who knew the trio, and they were extremely racist. They were extremely homophobic. At least the uncle was, and there are. It is reported in the paper, so we're not uh, creating anything here. 
that there was um, some type of sexual relationship between the um, brother that was charged and Louis Goche. And this was the reason that they had set out to go and, and murder him because he was um, being involved with an underage person. So, and it was all for drugs. It was just, right. you know. I mean, to hate somebody that much because of their sexuality. Um, I just, the yeah, but I don't slurs, think. Like, you know, you're a racist and you're homophobic. And uh, there's some pretty nasty stories about things that they had uh, said and how they carried themselves. So well, they, I, they, they killed him because he was homosexual. They killed exactly. their own relative because he went to the police. Because he talked. And if yeah. they were extremely racist from all accounts, then it it yeah. just it really makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? It, it does. To me, it does, but I'm not going to stop there because there's so much well, more. <laughs> well, and that's the thing is for so long, this was the obvious after we did our research and found all this out. It's like, well, it's got to be. I mean, it just, it is that there's no other solution. And because they were the local murderers because they had killed two people. That was the talk in the town as well. Um, And, and the fact that Sarah was afraid of somebody um, Mm -hmm. and we've had a lot of people come forward and say to us, it was supposed to be Sarah that went missing, not Melanie. Absolutely. And those words were used. It was mm -hmm. supposed to be Sarah. It was. And even Sarah herself expected from what yeah. we've been told, expected to go missing. So we just don't know who was out to get Sarah. So we'll leave that with you to ponder. It's something for you guys to think about. And if you have any more information, again, you can contact us or the police or, you know, just Crime help. Crime Stoppers, anybody. Well, but we're giving you some some more. And I, and um, I have to say, Candy, if... We don't want to inundate the OPP with stories and rumors so much. As That's if right. If people have a concrete tip, then That's yes, right. yes. They already have their plate full. Melanie's case is still very active. But at the same time, if they start getting bombarded with hundreds of phone calls, they have to do their due diligence and deal with every single one of those calls. So right now, um, if you do have a concrete tip, yes, call them. If you want to remain anonymous, call Crime Stoppers. If you have a feeling or a theory or a rumor, then call us and let us weed through it, (laughs) right? Because we don't want to inundate them because of what we're doing. That's just not fair to anybody. Um, That's a good point. Is that fair? No, that's it's a good absolutely point. Absolutely fair. Still doesn't end though, does it? We had nope. one more little item that Angela was going to discuss. Yeah. Well, and then and then <laughs> there's the story of the sketchy van. So remember earlier we told you that one of the boys' girlfriends walked the group part way to Pine Avenue and then they headed she headed back home past Melanie's. Um she was walking her big white dog. Well, on the way home, She was walking on the left side facing the traffic and a white van stopped and they asked her for directions to a particular street, which unfortunately she does not recall. Um, I spoke with her on the phone. Absolutely lovely young lady. But when they asked her for directions, she found it very odd because everybody in New Liskard knows all the streets and knows their way around. So they obviously weren't from the town. So she kept her distance. She was very leery. She was very cautious. And then her dog started to bark and freak out. She got frightened and the van just left. So when I asked her about the van, she described it as like a delivery van. It was white. Um, She wasn't sure. She, She said that she kept her distance. So she's trying to recall. She thinks that perhaps it did have a side door because she was keeping distance from it. And she's pretty positive. It was two men in their 30s. And she said, and that was my my 16-year-old eyes observing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, back then we would say, oh, they were old people. Yes. So, so yes. She, she guesstimated in their 30s, unkempt, unshaven. Um, she said maybe wearing like wife beater type shirts. 
So the police did come and speak with her in her driveway about this incident. And this van was also seen by another young woman who worked at the video store at the time, who also happened to be a sister of one of the boys that was with Melanie that night. And she was working the night that they came in to rent the movie that they later watched at Pine Avenue. So we'll just have a listen to this. But yeah, so the reason we wanted to get in touch with you because we heard that you saw a sketchy van. So I did. Tell me about that. Well, I was working at the movie store that night. The night that they came in um, to get a movie. But, and I remember it like it was yesterday. My brother was there. He's uh, younger than me, so he was the same age as Melanie. Okay, so he and, is younger. Yeah, he's 18 months younger. So they came in farted around and whatnot, and I think I ended up even paying for the movie. But, <laughs> um, and then they left, and and I keep going back, and I'm thinking, was it that night or was it the night after? But it couldn't have been the night after because I normally only worked one night in a, like in a weekend, mm-hmm. and then I worked a day shift during the week. So it was so it was that night. Um this van pulled up there's a big long window and you can see out in the parking lot and this this white it was almost like a cube van not um square but not um like an electrician's van kind of type thing Mm -hmm. utility van or yeah Mm -hmm. but it was all beat up um but and there was no signage or anything on it and anyway this man came in and he looked completely out of place he was wearing you know when you get a, a feeling you just get a really bad feeling mm-hmm. creepy feeling yep <laughs> shivers type thing yep so he walked in and he was wearing blue uh, work pants that were all not even quite blue yet they were Blue was almost gone, and a white shirt that was kind of, um, well, it wasn't white either anymore. It was almost yellowy. It was just grungy looking. Mm -hmm. And he had sandy blonde hair. How old old would you peg him at? I would say mid-40s. Okay. Then... And yeah, around that. Was he by himself? He was. Well, as far as I know, now he didn't. He didn't look like he was in there looking for a movie. He just looked out of place, and he gave me the heebie-jeebies. Um, and I even thought to myself, "I'm going to get a license plate number." So I looked out the window, but where the van was parked, it was parked too close up to, and the light was out. Um, above it, so I couldn't see anything. Mm. So I was going to go out the back door, but what if there was someone else in the van? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No. So he didn't even speak to you, did he? No, I think I asked him if I could help him, and he completely ignored me. So mm. he didn't stay for long, and then he left, and I actually phoned my dad, because normally I walk home, and where we live um, is actually close to where Melanie was watching the movie that night. It was just, it's just a couple blocks over. So I usually walk home pretty much probably the same route that she took home. Mm-hmm. Um, but I asked my dad to come and pick me up that night. So you're pretty sure that was the same night Melanie went missing. Mm-hmm. Um, do you remember and nobody what? talked to me? Nobody. They. I know the police went into the the video store. <clears throat> excuse me. And just confirmed that the kids were in. Or the kids. I'm calling them kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were all kids then, right? <laughs> yeah. Um. That they were in there, and they did get a movie, and that was that was confirmed, and that was it. There was no. Nobody came to talk to me. Nobody said anything. 
now they hounded my brother and the boys like there was no tomorrow but um so it was him and mel and that came into the store yes and do you remember what time that was it wasn't early but it wasn't that late like i would gosh like it was dark out i remember that so, what time does it get dark at the end of September? Eight-ish? I'm just trying to think. Eight, eight, yeah, eight, eight, eight thirty-ish. So, it must have been around nine, maybe nine, nine thirty. And that gentleman came in, or that man came in. It was close to closing time, and we closed at 11, so he probably came in around 10.30. So, the police were aware that this gentleman had come into the store? Somebody told him, your dad or you? No, no. Nobody asked. Nobody, the police were not aware. As far as I know, they're still not aware. Okay, so nobody told the police about the creepy guy? No. Okay. Um, so you went to the English school then, is that right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And... Melanie went to the French school, ESSM, but did, yes. you, did you know her before your brother started hanging out with her? Was she a... I knew of her. Okay. Um, but I didn't know her to, to sit and have a conversation with her. Okay. Nice girl? Yes. Yeah. Very. That's what we've heard. She was lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so very sad. Um, like, it, it's heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Just into thin air, and 24 years later, no... Still nothing. No answers, yeah. And there was so much speculation. There was no speculation about hunters, because a lot of them come through town here. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what I was going to ask you during our conversation today, was what kind of rumors did you ever hear? Mostly about the hunters. Okay. Some or someone passing through town, but it was mostly hunters. Mm -hmm. So he didn't look like a hunter, though, did he? No. From the sound. No, of not it. at all. No. Hmm. No, he looked like a like a working uh, almost. I shouldn't say it. Okay. Um, <laughs> like he was working at a farm. Like he was working. Like he was a farmer. Like he just didn't. You know, he had the work pants, the work boots, yeah. the white dirty shirt. Um, and you said he was fair, dirty blonde hair. Dirty blonde, yeah. Yeah. Height, weight? I would say he wasn't overly tall. I would say he was about 5'8", five 5'9". Five okay. Um, as for weight, I don't, I suck at gauging weight. Yeah, but he, he wasn't, wasn't um, too skinny or too fat. Kind of no. average. Okay. Kind of in the middle. Like, he definitely wasn't skinny, skinny, and he definitely was not overweight. Okay. We're trying to not look at it with blinders on. And, right. uh, you know, keep a very open mind, because it could very well have been just some random person passing through. Mm -hmm. So every little bit helps, and, and every tiny little bit is a puzzle piece, and it is a big, big puzzle with many, many pieces. This young woman was never spoken to by the police until very recently. So what do you think? White van, a red herring, or deserves more discussion? A stranger or two strangers unfamiliar with the town that are asking for directions that both young women describe as creepy and unsettling? We will continue this discussion and start some new ones in our next episode. We would like to thank you all for your many kind words and messages of encouragement and support throughout our project. There, there's just been so much support. Please give us a review on your favorite platform, whatever that may be. We are just three moms, like I've stated before. We're trying to do some good in a world that can sometimes feel so evil. That's it. Our intentions are pure. We have limited access to archived newspaper articles that far back, so we're doing the best that we can. We are challenged by current technology. Very much so. <laughs> Almost in tears sometimes. Uh, we're learning as we go. We're hoping by gathering facts and listening to people share info 
we can deliver an accurate story about a missing person. We hope by sharing through this platform and social media that it will engage the public in conversation, that they may wrap their brains trying to remember something. They may finally feel the urge to come forward with something they thought was either unimportant or not applicable. They may have been holding on to something for so long that they can no longer bear the burden. No matter the case, we are just trying to elicit the answer or answers that are missing by engaging and encouraging the public to be involved. Someone out there knows something. That's a fact. It is not our intention to impede the police investigation whatsoever. Quite the opposite, actually. We are asking people to share what they know with the police, with Crime Stoppers, or if they feel more comfortable, they can share with us and we will pass the information along. The police are not able to share what they've investigated or continue to investigate. The investigation is private. If they do not release information, they have a good reason for not doing so. Because we don't know what they've investigated thus far, we are sharing all the facts and theories that have been shared with us in an attempt to eliminate them or for more information to come forward. And we thank all of you for listening today, for sharing and caring. So many strangers that have shown us kindness and support in this project who aim for the same goal we do. We want nothing more than for Celine to have Melanie come home. Amen. Amen. At the end of each episode, we are going to feature our friends at Please Bring Me Home, sharing one of their many missing persons cold cases with you. They focus on many cases with many volunteers, but at the moment, they don't have a podcast platform. So we are more than happy to share because like we've stated before, if we don't work together, the chances of crossing the finishing line are that much more challenging. So we're all about working together. And hopefully you will help us shed some light on their cases as well. If you have a tip about Megan Pilon's case, which they are discussing today, please contact pleasebringmehome.com. But please, if you have a tip about Melanie's case, Melanie Etier, contact the OPP, Crime Stoppers, or if more comfortable, contact us at Shedding Light. All the links are on our web page or our Facebook page or attached to this podcast recording. Hello, my name is Melissa Harwood. I am a co-founder at Please Bring Me Home and the Director of Research and Analysis. I am currently working on looking into the disappearance and case of Megan Rose Pilon, who went missing from Sudbury, Ontario on September 11, 2013. Megan was only age 15 when she was last seen leaving the hospital in Sudbury after visiting her father that day following his recent back surgery. He states that Megan seemed out of sorts, perhaps some intense feelings of anxiety or possibly under the influence of drugs. And as we so often hear about young people falling into bad patterns of behavior and oftentimes hanging out with the wrong crowd of people, this appears to be the case for 15-year-old Megan, who began hanging out with her much older neighbor at the time, a woman by the name of Winona Moore. Over the years, there have been people who have claimed that they have seen Megan, others who have said or suggested that Megan fell into a lifestyle of human trafficking and got herself into trouble that way. The police did a thorough search for Megan in the Espanola area of the Spanish River based on tips and information which they received previously. This search was also met with negative results. It has now almost been seven years since anyone has seen or heard from Megan Rose Pilon. Her father misses her dearly and her aunts are her greatest supporters and have never given up on finding Megan in order to bring her home. Natasha Pickering in local Sudbury, Ontario, and a recent new member of Please Bring Me Home has been dedicated and relentless as well in her search for finding Megan for several years now. Megan's room still remains untouched, awaiting her return. A simple planned song with the lyrics, I'm sorry I can't be perfect, written on Megan's wall. Megan was a teenage girl who was just starting to assert herself and find her way in the world, just as many young people are. We are presently planning a search or several searches for Megan in attempts to bring her home and provide some much needed closure for her father and other family members. Somebody always knows something. And by the grace of God, if someone out there knows something about what happened to Megan, then please call us at Please Bring Me Home's anonymous tip line at 1-800-273-8255. 
1-226-702-2728. Or you may also submit an anonymous tip through our website at www.pleasebringmehome.com. You may also contact Michael Raskovicius of the Greater Sudbury Police Service, Criminal Investigations Division at one seven zero five six seven five nine one seven one extension two three seven five. Thank you for your time. Join us on episode three, where we will discuss more in depth the police investigation. We will elaborate on some of our theories and perhaps discuss information we have received from you, the public. On the next episode, it was just amazing. Uh, you know the the major case management, uh, the follow-up that was done, the resources that were used. We had undercover uh, people at our disposal. We had spin teams. There there are teams of five and six cars that work together that will follow anybody, any place that we want them followed to. Uh, They were at our disposal. Wiretap, polygraph, uh, everything was there for for our use, and, and money was no question. They were at our beck and call. Not that I had the pull to get them in, but the detective inspector that we worked with, they do. You you don't get a, a, a polygraph test very often in an investigation. With these guys, when you work with them, you want one, you got one. But it was just, uh, the, the resources were put there, I'll tell you that, for sure. He was raised so very, very racist. He would break to everyone about going to Toronto and picking up black people and bringing them up north and turning them loose in the bush and hunting them down like moose. The fall all around you Not Happen. So many emotions to feel.